You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, Sri Lanka is facing possibly its biggest environmental disaster as a ship carrying more than a thousand chemical containers sinks near the country's coast. As the United Nations warns we're using an unsustainable amount of natural resources, I'll be speaking to the head of the UN Environment Programme about what more can be done to protect our planet. And how discarded fishing nets are making whales smaller. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those developing the solutions. And coming up, find out how David Beckham is helping make bin lorries more environmentally friendly. But we start today with what could be the worst environmental disaster in Sri Lanka's history. A fire-damaged cargo ship carrying tonnes of chemicals has sunk off the country's coast, spilling chemicals, oil and microplastics and threatening the country's pristine beaches, waters and marine life. Well, the MV Express Pearl left the Hazira port in India on the 15th of May and was heading to Singapore. On the 20th of May, it was waiting to enter the port in Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, for a scheduled stop when a fire broke out on the vessel. Authorities were towing the ship into deep water when it began sinking yesterday, a day after the blaze was extinguished. Well, it was carrying 1,486 containers, including 25 tonnes of nitric acid and other chemicals and cosmetics. Now, most of the vessel's cargo was destroyed in the fire, polluting surrounding waters, as well as a long stretch of the country's beaches. But authorities are now worried the oil on board could be an even bigger problem, as Siobhan Robbins reports. Off the coast of Sri Lanka, the Navy is on high alert. A potential oil spill, the latest environmental threat posed by this sinking ship. In the last fortnight, the vessel laden with chemicals has already been hit by an explosion and fire, sending smoke belching into the atmosphere and washing masses of plastic pellets into the sea. Potentially three billion Plastic pellets have been released to the environment. So it is one of the worst environmental impacts already. Now, if there was an oil spill and some of the containers leak, we're going to actually have a bigger disaster. This is what the pellets have already done to some of the country's beaches. Fishing has been temporarily banned in the nearby area. For some wildlife, the pollution has been deadly. It is really sad to see turtles being uh, died on the shore and uh, the fishes, dead fishes and uh, the marine life uh, come to the shore. Uh, we can see so many dead bodies on the beach. The plastic pollution caused here is expected to impact the whole of the northern Indian Ocean and the threat of an oil spill still looms. The next few hours could prove vital in preventing an even bigger ecological disaster. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News. Well, joining me now from Colombo is Malisha Gunawardana, advocacy coordinator at the Pearl Protectors, a volunteer-based organisation protecting the marine environment of Sri Lanka. Welcome to you. Just how big an environmental disaster do you think this is for Sri Lanka? Um, currently, we have been warned of a possible oil spill because the ship has started to sink, but we are already looking at a pellet spill that started um, just six weeks ago, six days ago. And um, with an oil spill also coming, it will just add on to the worst ecological disaster that we've seen in our lifetime with the ongoing nerdle pollution um, on our on our beaches that's just spreading on even to the southern coast area of Sri Lanka. Well, yes, because the ship was carrying nitric acid as well as chemicals and cosmetics. And as you say, now the fear that there'll be an oil spill as well. What are you most concerned about? What could do the most damage? Um, it could be most damaging to uh, marine wildlife because our waters are abundant with uh, marine wildlife. We have 
five out of the seven species of sea turtles coming into the beaches of Sri Lanka to nest. And we have uh, whales that never really migrate out of our waters. And we have dolphins and we have really sensitive coastal ecosystems and marine ecosystems that will really be impacted by this because once the oil does leak, it will leave an oil slick um, on the water. And we know that marine mammals like sea turtles, they surface to breathe. And so they're likely to breathe in these toxins and it'll really have a very damaging impact on their health. And if the oil does go into the water column, then the fish will also be impacted. Malisha Gunawardana, thanks very much indeed. In today's other climate news, peatlands are being destroyed to make way for palm oil plantations in Indonesia. That's according to the group Human Rights Watch, who've criticised the country's government for not doing more to stop the expansion of the crop. Peatlands store an estimated 80 billion tonnes of carbon, but once damaged, carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere, causing an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, when you think of bin lorries, you probably wouldn't assume that David Beckham is involved. But the former footballer has taken a 10% stake in Lunas, a vehicle electrification company. They convert classic cars into electric ones and have announced they'll start upcycling and converting heavy industrial vehicles such as refuse trucks and fire engines. They say converting vehicles to run on electricity is cheaper and more sustainable than scrapping them and buying new ones. And a species of whale is shrinking, according to a study published by Current Biology. North Atlantic right whales are a metre shorter than they were 30 years ago because of the stresses of being entangled in fishing nets. It means that they're less likely to be able to reproduce and are more likely to die from becoming caught in fishing gear. The world needs to rewild an area the size of China with the level of ambition seen in the space race. That's the recommendation from the United Nations Environment Programme, which has launched a decade of ecosystem restoration. It's calling for action to restore land on a scale never seen before, saying that existing conservation efforts are insufficient to prevent widespread biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. Now, they found that degradation, the deterioration of the environment through depletion of natural resources is affecting an estimated 3.2 billion people. That's 40% of the world's population. One third of the world's farmland is now degraded. And around 66% of ocean ecosystems are damaged, degraded or modified. But 115 governments have committed to restoring around 1 billion hectares of land by 2030. Forests and landscapes can be restored by planting seeds where natural regeneration isn't happening. And agroforestry can be used to grow both trees and crops, increasing biodiversity, habitats and storing carbon. Biodiversity loss is already costing the global economy 10% of its output each year. But the report found that every $1 invested in restoration creates up to $30 in economic benefits. Well, let's bring in then the executive director of the UN Environment Programme, Inga Anderson. And uh, you're calling on the world to rewild and restore an area the size of China. That's a huge ask. So why do you think it's so important? Well, as you rightly said, and you uh, described some of the figures from the report, the trajectory that we are on is simply not sustainable. Um, we are assuming that the terrestrial and marine life is limitless, but it is not, is it? And so if we are um, degrading, polluting and exhausting and losing fertility of our soils, uh, and if we're emptying our seas, that clearly is not a, a, a good solution for the future. So we have no option but to insist on restoration. And at this point, this is very, very clear that this is what we now must do. Um, at this point, what we are calling for is this decade. We have these uh, 115 countries that have signed up uh, to ensure that we have ecosystem restoration on this 1 billion hectare. And, and it is entirely possible. We know, for example, that if, if we leave nature, just let it rest, it will regenerate. We know it from our gardens, from our, our farms, etc. Now, 
what we understand also, of course, is that when we use shade agriculture, when we work with agroforestry, not only is it good for our crops, but it is also very, very good for soil fertility. Then we need to use less chemicals and then we'll have less runoff in our groundwater and into our oceans. So there are so many benefits. And of course, it's not only good for biodiversity, it's not only good for climate, it's also good for poverty reduction, obviously. Uh, and so uh, at this point, we are trying to mobilize a global movement for restoration. Inga Anderson, thanks very much indeed. My pleasure. Bangladesh is one of the countries most at risk from climate change, but nearly all of its energy currently comes from fossil fuels. To move towards more renewable sources, they say they need help from developed countries, including more money. Climate finance is going to be a big topic at COP26, which the UK is hosting in November. The summit's president, Alok Sharma, is visiting countries, including Bangladesh, to discuss the issue before the official event. Well, our correspondent, Katerina Vitozzi, is in Dakar for us now. And Katerina, tell us more about why Alok Sharma is there and what he said to you today. Yeah, well, Alok Sharma is in Bangladesh for a two-day visit. It's part of a wider tour of some of this region's most climate-vulnerable countries. And his message has been broadly the same to everywhere he's visited. He's been urging countries to stick uh, to emissions targets as well as climate change pledges. And a big one of those is, of course, with regards to fossil fuels. Uh, Mr Sharma has says that he sees it as a personal priority for him uh, to end coal power. But, of course, that isn't easy in a country like Bangladesh, which remains overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels for their energy. And now, because of COVID quarantine protocols, we spoke to Mr Sharma over Zoom. Here is what he said. In the case of Bangladesh, I've raised this issue with ministers here, uh, and I've been pleased to hear that uh, they are already looking at reducing the number of uh, new power plants that they have uh, in, in the pipeline. Uh, but of course, the way to ensure that we consign coal to history is to also support countries like Bangladesh to make that clean energy transition. Well, Mr Sharma talked there about transition to renewable energies, and that isn't an easy transition, and it's not a cheap one either. It will cost billions of dollars. And G7 countries are yet to meet a pledge that they made 11 years ago to be providing $100 billion worth of financing per year to some of the world's most vulnerable countries in order to finance that transition. And for leaders here, that is still a real point of contention. They say that the world's biggest carbon polluters need to be paying and giving more money to those countries that are still most at risk. Well, that's everything from us for today. Tomorrow, how sailors in the ocean race are helping to tackle climate change as they compete. That's at the same time tomorrow here on Sky News. See you then.